going to preach a 12-minute sermon, and then we're going to have a panel of four of us, two married couples, my bride, and then Andy and Anwin. And we're just going to talk it out. I was at a Christmas party about 12 years ago. And there were 15 unruly kids in a garage, Wendy will remember this, under the age of 10. <laughs> and um, <laughs> parents didn't know what to do. And it was like, I mean, like rip the house apart unruly. So we just want to have a good Christmas party and the kids were wild. Uh, it may or may not have had something to do with sweets. I don't know. <laughs> they were out in the garage. And I used to make a living speaking to kiddos. So I said, Wendy, watch this. She's seen it many times. I go out in the garage. This is all I said. I mean, guys, when I say wild, I mean wild. You remember the night I'm talking about? I said, I want to tell you guys a story. Instantly, it goes from Mach 11 to all the kids just stopped what they were doing. And they all sat down. I didn't ask them to sit down. And I told about an eight-minute story about a tomato named Tommy. And it worked. The other wives went to their husbands and asked, can you please learn to do what Chad just did? <laughs> There's something about story that mesmerizes us. The Bible is 95% narrative. It's a gigantic story. A lot of Westerners read the Bible like it's a VCR manual. We have a problem. Let me scroll up. You know those Bible answer books? I hate those things. Struggling with finances, go to F finances. God, tell me what to do. The truth is the Bible's a narrative, and I want to tell you, I believe the saddest story I've ever heard, you've heard it, and it goes something like this. This is weird. It's got snakes, and it's got two naked people. That right there will make a kid get off his device and stare at me right now. So as the pastor of this church, I want to tell you a story, kiddos, about a snake and two naked people. You ready, Henry? Could get fun. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman says to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will certainly not die, serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her. Can we say with her? her. Who was with her? And he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were open and they realized that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man. Everyone say man. Thank you. That's very good. The Lord God called to the man. Where are you? Uh, I'm not about to beat husbands up, and I'm also not about to give you seven steps to a more practical, healthy marriage. You implement these seven steps. By July, you will be like James Dobson. (laughs) You're going to talk about one thing. The man fell short of the father's expectations in that story. Now, I love this about God. You know what God does? God actually shows so much grace. He makes fig leaves for them. It was to their benefit that they get out of the garden. 
You wouldn't want to live forever in a sin state like that. Let's try not to go there in our minds, though. This is the most probably most talked about narrative in the history of the universe. If you Google it, there's millions of books, I'm assuming. Fall of man, depravity of man. But today I just want to talk about the fact that Adam was with Eve and God came looking for Adam. So this is going to be kind of weird. Remember the old gold rush, the 49ers, back in San Francisco days? Well, it repeated itself because history tends to do that back in the 80s. And everybody seemed to rush out to Palo Alto because they wanted to strike gold in the tech business, right? It was dot-com this and dot-com that and dot-com this. There were 21-year-olds becoming millionaires overnight, and then they would lose it a week later. It was like a rush to get rich quick. And so if you listed all of the dot-com companies that started in the 80s, it would be hundreds of thousands of them. And not many of them made it. A few of them did. You may or may not have heard of Amazon.com. You may or may not have heard of Google. You may have heard of eBay. So I read a study one time, and the question was this. What made a few dot-com companies successful, and why did all the other ones fail? Here's what made them successful. The ones that are still successful today focused on very boring systems. The other companies spent their money on other things. Marketing, flamboyant campaigns, promotion. It was those three companies that focused on the boring systems and they see breakthrough even today. I mean, my goodness, you're talking about we've never seen anything like this in terms of success. I mean, look at Amazon. Who would have ever ever thought that with one click of a button you can have milk delivered to your door? Well, what does that have to do with marriages? What in the world? So during worship this morning, before we sang a Ben King song, which I loved, the Holy Spirit was talking to me about reaping and sowing. He didn't talk to me about that until this morning. Here's a big principle for your marriage. You reap, you sow, you reap, you sow, principally driven. Boring will bring your breakthrough. Well, what is the system that you need? The father's expectation is for the husband to protect and nurture his wife and his family. I could sit here and list about 12 practical things you can do, but I just want to start with the expectation from the father from this narrative. He didn't come looking for Eve. He came looking for Adam. And Eve was not by herself when that serpent was talking with her. I looked at that this morning. He was with her. Adam was with her. Adam was with her. Adam did not step into the ordained role. You say, well, what is the ordained role? Now watch this. Adam comes first. The father makes Adam. What does the father do for Adam? Here's what he does. He loves him, he blesses him, he protects him. He enjoys him. So out of the rib, speaking of ribs, someone brought me championship rub today. I've been, can, you, can you show me this, Wendy? Can you hand this to me? This is unbelievable. I've got to go off on a little rabbit trail here. I've been given some incredible gifts as a pastor, but this is at the top. I almost started crying. This is, <laughs> speaking of ribs, this is championship rub that has won contests, right? And I asked what was in it, and the person would not tell me. We'll deal with that later with some church discipline. I'll get to the bottom of it. <laughs> Eve comes from the rib. What does the father say? You ready? I want you to do for Eve what I've done for you, Adam. So what is that? Believe in her, protect her, have empathy. Pull for her, pray for her. Bless her. The word's Barak in Hebrew. God created Adam to bless him. That's going to bother some some people. God created Adam to bless him. What does he want the husband to do? Bless your wife. What does that look like? If you have to have me tell you what it looks like to bless your wife, I'm telling you, now's a great time, and I'm not trying to be funny, to go get some therapy. When do you not have? Do you honestly have to ask yourself how to bless anyone else in your life? I don't think so. God tells uh, Abram in Genesis 12, I'm going to bless you, bless those who bless you, and I want you to bless others. The role of the husband is to bless his wife. Well, well, how do you do that? Act like the father. So if the man, the husband, the dad of the family walks in friendship with the father, the natural expression is you just give away what you're receiving from the father. And yet something so easily understood has been repeated. Genesis 3 is repeated over and over and over and over and over. If I'm being objective, and I asked Wendy if she agrees with this, in 24 years of ministry, the number one, and there's no close second, problem we deal with with the sheep in the local body It's the wife in the role of husband in their marriage. 
We brought an outside voice in to help us work through some conflict bridgeway in the past couple of years. And the outside professional counselor said, well, the first thing that jumps off the page to me is that uh, a lot of the conflict is driven by the wife being the leader in the home. You say, what does that have to do with anything? We have a structural principle, really, problem in our marriages that's found in Genesis 3, way before Ephesians 5. And you reap what you sow. I, I tell you this, I want to dare you to do this. Husbands, start targeting your wives in prayer every day for three minutes behind her back. Just, just start there. Just do that. And watch what happens. Before the panel comes up, I want to share two stories. One, Wendy and I took our 17-year-old to a college that he is really thinking about going to next year. I could feel a good cry coming on. Because I remember when he was you know, that big, and 10 minutes later, it's like, How's he going to college and who's going to pay for it? You know what I mean? <laughs> and the father showed me this. He said, I'm doing a fresh creation in your marriage. As your kids are exiting your home, your marriage is getting the stronger it's ever been. I really believe that oil flows from the top down. I believe it's an ordained time in this church for God. There's a supernatural grace upon marriages. Does anyone else detect that, by the way? Anybody? The second story is this. I was at Regent University. I didn't want to minister. I went there to not minister at all. I was just there to study. So, of course, what happens? Professor calls on me. The professor says, uh, Mr. Norris, would you mind coming to share a devotion this morning? And I wanted to say, I don't, I don't want that. I don't want to do that. I went up there and I told a story about Adam and Eve and how God loved Adam. He just wants Adam to love Eve. And the whole point of life is learning for me to lay down my life for someone else, specifically my wife first and then my kiddos. Uh, I don't know what happened in the room other than it was like the opposite of a spirit of laughter. It was a spirit of crying. And this, this woman in the class began to cry, and we began to minister to her. This principle is at the top of the food chain for the father. He's a father. And so what does he want a husband to be? A father, a protector. So what do you do if that's just not your story right now? You really seek intimacy with the Father more than you do marriage uh, strategy. And as you learn to bond with the Father, a natural outpouring of that is you learn to give away what you're receiving. I'm going to ask the panel to come up. You guys go ahead and come up here. Uh, what if it's possible that all we need to do is look at Genesis 3 and say, what if the Father is asking the same question thousands of years later that he did back then. Husband, where are you? Here's what I love about grace. All a husband has to do is take one step towards, hey, wife, I don't know how to do this, and I'm actually kind of scared right now, and I'm actually kind of shaking in my boots, but I'm sick and tired of not actually like leaning into taking responsibility to leading you and the kids. You know what'll happen? A grace will begin to hit husbands when you show vulnerability and just read Genesis 3 and say, I don't want this to be said about me. A lot of times the father says, Chad, where are you? Andy, where, where are you? And um, Andy's the one that actually taught me this. You want to sit right here, babe? Andy actually taught me this. Uh, I've got a Master of Divinity and working on a doctorate, and I have never noticed in Genesis 3, it never occurred to me that the father didn't come looking for both of them. When did Abba show you that? Um, credit where credit's due. It was actually Caleb who showed me that. Your son. Yes. Yeah. And we were having the conversation with him um, because when I realized this in my marriage that I'd been passive, um, the metaphor that I was really thinking through at the time was how I had been like Ahab and how I had, um, had abdicated my role um, in marriage. And I began to talk to, I talked to each of my children, I took them all out and talked to them about how that had affected them and that I, I, I said I was sorry for it. Let's stop right there. As a charismatic pastor, I hear more about Jezebel than I do Jesus Christ a lot of times. And uh, I want you to tell the story because Jezebel was never the problem in that story. So what was the story of Jezebel and Ahab and why was Ahab the problem? Ahab was uh, given the rulership. Um, he, was, he was the king, but he married um, Jezebel um, who influenced um, Israel and took Israel on a, um, on a, a journey that was one of compromise. And she began to rule. She brought in Baal worship, um, Asherah worship, and set up all of these uh, false gods. And she was effectively ruling um, in that place. And Ahab just let her do it um, and didn't take responsibility. Elijah the prophet 
Um, God actually sent him to Ahab to deal with Ahab in the story. Again, not sending originally to, to Jezebel because Ahab was the, was the one responsible for allowing that to happen. And when Ahab and Jezebel was way before Ahab and Jezebel, it just happened in Genesis 3. Yeah. I just read it. How did it happen? How did what happen? How was Adam actually Ahab? In because Genesis? he was being passive. Like he was there, like you just said, he was present. Um, when the snake was asking those questions and he didn't step up into the role that he was called to. I'm just curious. Let's go Amwin and then uh, Wendy, just practically. Why do you think more husbands don't step up? Um, I think they're afraid. I think um, there's not been any modeling. I think there's been generations of not modeling what it looks to be a father and a husband. I think um, they're afraid of failing. I think they also... I think one of the things that's happened in our Western culture is that men have taken that responsibility of provider so seriously that work actually becomes an idol. And so because all their energy goes to work, they have no energy left when they come home, and that's where they become passive. And I think because there's a role that has to happen in a home to be led, what happens is the women step into that role because it's not being given by the husband. What do you think men are... That's really good, Amy. What do you think men are scared of the most, babe? You know, I mean, and the truth is, is that Adam really, outside of the father, which is an, a massive, wonderful model, he didn't really have another human to model this after. And so, standing there with Eve, I imagine this. A sanctified imagination goes to that place and wonder what that was like for him to stand there. What, what made him so confused in that moment? What made him not say, Eve, stop that. I don't know what this is. You know, sometimes I wonder if, if husband's heart for cherishing their wife, if it gets confused inside of those moments, like I love her, and so because I love her, I let her. Yeah. And when I really love someone, I don't always let it's really good. Ephesians 5 is the epic passage, Andy. Mutual submission. Yet, in Ephesians 5, it's pretty clear that the Father's expectations in Genesis 3 is actually stated way more clearly by Paul. Mm -hmm. And his expectation is for a husband to lead. Mm -hmm. Yet, it's the most conflict we've ever caused on a Coach and Joe show. All I did was have Alex Rodriguez on to share his testimony. And all heck broke loose. And we were contacted... How dare you talk about this? Who do you think you are? It's just Ephesians 5. I'm mm -hmm. not going to read it. Most people know it. It's husbands, lead your wives. It's mutual submission. It's honor I have love. it right here in the message. It's actually really good. Right. You want me to read it? Yeah, I'd love to read it. And then I'm going to hear some thoughts on it. Well, I mean, just because it's, it, it really is pretty profound. Husbands, go all out in love for your wives, exactly as Christ did for the church. A love marked by giving, not getting. Christ's love makes the church whole. His words evoke her beauty. Everything he does and says is designed to bring the best out of her, dressing her in dazzling white silk, radiant with holiness. And that is how husbands ought to love their wives. They're really doing themselves a favor since they're already one in marriage. No one abuses his own body, does he? No, he feeds it and pampers it. That's how Christ treats us, the church, since we are part of his body. And that is why a man leaves father and mother and cherishes his wife. No longer two, they become one flesh. This is a huge mystery, and I don't pretend to understand it all. What is clearest to me is the way Christ treats the church, and this provides a good picture of how each husband is to treat his wife, loving himself and loving her, and how each wife is to honor her husband. Thoughts. Let's, let's go Andy, Anwin, Wendy. Thoughts on that passage. What struck me in that translation there is about giving. Um, I think the reality of a lot of men is that because they feel depleted, they try and take and receive. Um, so whether that's you know, taking a, a, a sense of identity and worth and well-being from their work, or whether it's um, I come home and I expect my wife to be able to give to me, mm -hmm. um, and actually that passage flips the whole thing on its head. Mm -hmm. um, you know, God so loved the world that he gave. And so um, it's, it's a completely different perspective for the man to be full and so then able to give. Mm. 
And I think that comes back to what Chad was saying of, you know, to what extent as men are we deeply connected to the Father so that we are full of love. We are full of His love. And so we're then able to give that love away. I took a prayer walk in Colorado. We were at marriage therapy and I was really frustrated because I wanted God to fix my spouse because life, Amen. life revolves around <laughs> Life's all about me, right? Rick Warren, right. chapter one, nothing's right. about you. Yeah. And I said, Lord, I just don't understand. And I heard loud, greater love has no man than this. And he laid down his life for those he loves. Why is it hard, Amway? Because it works both ways. What's the, is it selfishness? What's going on here? Um, I mean, I can only speak from personal experience. But I think, I think the other thing is, in that passage, I was reading that this morning, that I think it's really important to look at what are we talking about with leadership. Because the word leadership, you can download all sorts of concepts. And it really clearly says in the message, it's not about domineering, it's about cherishing. Good leaders raise up those around them. Good leaders know the people that are around them and their strengths, and they empower them to be the fullness of who they're called to be. Which means that the husband's role is not about squashing the wife, it's about him getting bigger for her to be raised up. And I think that's really important because in my past, basically any word around submission or being led by my husband, I downloaded that that meant I was devalued, and that's a lie. It's not true. His role is to get big, and my role is to get big, but my role is to sit underneath his wing and to be nurtured and cherished in that place. And so I think it's about what does it mean to be a leader. I think that's really important. Wendy, what's the role in this conversation? Thanks, forgiveness. <laughs> oh, gosh, what's the role of forgiveness? Yes. Can I have a water, Miriam? Yeah, what's the role of forgiveness? Because I like what Anne said from her own experience. That's what, thank you, that she just shared from her own experience, what's going on with them. You and I have seen God do great things in our marriage, and forgiveness has been... It's been a massive role. Yeah. I mean, I think that's why I don't know how to quite start to talk about it, is because it is a primary uh, ingredient to a healthy marriage, to a healthy relationship. Um, Ephesians is you know, clear about this with men and women and the role of, of husband and wife inside the home, but it's also at the beginning of chapter 4, it says, uh, be humble and gentle with one another, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. You know, giving each other room to fail one another. And so forgiveness becomes a lot easier when I've already expected you to not be enough in an area. Um, if, if Eve... If Adam had, had looked at Eve in that moment, you know, these are kind of those sanctified what-ifs. He looked at her and said, Eve, hold on a second. I mean, she initiated that. He was with her, but she initiated it. And I love us women, but we initiate a lot of stuff we shouldn't be doing. Mm. Yeah. I mean, she initiated sin. Yeah. But sin didn't enter the world until he agreed with it. Yeah. Right it was his agreement inside that covenant that began to break down. <laughs> Team, teamwork was a part of the worst story in the history of yeah, humanity. It was. It was, but it, but it didn't happen until then. And so, you know, what if he had just said, whoa, hold on, hold on, and rein it in. And they had had a little side conversation first. And he's like, listen, I forgive you. I mean, I, I saw that was kind of tempting. I mean, quite frankly, I was a little drawn to it too, but I had me a little check, and, yeah. and so I forgive you. You know, creating space for one another to just not be on all the time, not to be spiritually there all the time, not to be mature in every moment. I'm not going to be mature in every single moment. I'm not going to be full of energy in every single moment. So my mind is going to be operating at a, at a really high level at every single moment. I mean, there are going to be some times that I'm just angry and I'm mad and I'm irritated or I'm disappointed. And it comes out in different ways. We have to create space for each other to do that. And forgiveness fosters that. Forgiveness fosters it. It has to be a constant in our conversations yeah. Yeah. with one another. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of want to make out with you right now. <laughs> <laughs> I forgive you for being so honest. <laughs> I think you've touched me more. I, like the more you talk, you, I'm just like. I'm <laughs> <laughs> we would sit in the car like this before we had children. We would sit in the car, and he would be driving, and, we would long, and, and he would say, hold, hold my arm like a baby, and I would just hold <laughs> your arm. <clears throat> now every once in a while he'll do this, and I'm like, mm, I got three of them. I don't need your arm. I got three babies. I mean, my love language is touch. Wendy's Mine's not. 
I'm sorry. Hers I forgive the other you. four. Andy, let's get really practical. What a husband sitting in here going, all right, God's looking for me. Let's, let's be reasonable. You don't have to go out here being James Dobson. Just take a small step in a direction of positivity. Mm-hmm. Give me a one practical. Let me, let me go back to the story for a minute first um, because God did come looking for Adam. And it's really interesting how Adam responds because what he says is, the woman He blames God, too. He blames the woman first. And then God. And then he says, that you gave me. <laughs> the woman that you gave me. In other words, uh, it wasn't me. Yeah, I'm out. I, I, I'm, uh, I'm out. I, yeah, it's, it, it's got nothing to do with me. Can you imagine how embarrassed he must be at times when people meet him in heaven? <laughs> he walks around with a sign that says, I'm sorry, get over it. <laughs> <laughs> so he didn't take responsibility. So, yeah, that, I mean, that's one of the... That's, I, I would say that for me is probably the biggest deal, that actually as a man, you suddenly come to a wake-up moment where you go, hang on a minute, this is on me. This is not on my wife. The Father has lined me up to act in this situation. And no matter what it is, I have to take some kind of step. I can't just sit there passively and hope that, that somehow the culture in my home is going to be okay. And I've got to do the best I can. I'm not going to be perfect, but I've got to do the best I can. So I, I was, for me, I probably reacted in all kinds of ways when it first hit me. I was like, oh no, I've got to meet my kids. I've got to say sorry to them. I've got to start. And I, 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 I overswing into this aggressive way of operating. And then I realize that's not going to be sustainable. And I gradually come back into, okay, what could I do simply each week or each day. Um, and for me, that comes down to conversation. And specifically with Amwin, it's actually choosing to really listen to her um, because she wants to be heard. And so often, if I'm engaged with me and I'm thinking about myself and what can I get and all that, I'm not actually listening to her. So that's not giving to her. Whereas what I can give to her is time to really hear what's going on in her heart. Um, and it's this, and what you said in, in your 12-minute talk, pray, even if it's just for a few minutes. We're actually going to do that right now. Ben, can you come back up here, wherever you are? And here's what I want us to do. I'm going to close with a story as Ben comes. I think another practical step for a husband to lead well is to own your mistakes. Yeah. Sit the family down, sit your wife down, say, listen, I really am sorry. Mm-hmm. I'm doing the best I possibly can. And there's something about just stepping into vulnerability of what you're not. A grace will hit a marriage. Yeah. A grace will hit a family. Yeah. Uh, I, I think we can actually have way too many hyper-spiritual moments with our kiddos. Yeah. You know, a husband will be like, all right, I don't want God coming to look for me, and he can't find me. So now when I grill out, I'm going to talk to Sam about Galatians for an hour and a half. <laughs> nah, maybe you just want to talk about football. Yeah. But I think uh, owning with your kids and your wife who you're not, gives space for grace to hit. Would you agree? I would totally agree because you're basically saying we're going to create a culture of honesty, yeah. Yeah. a culture of vulnerability in this home, a culture of forgiveness. You know, I mean, in, in many ways, um, Adam was establishing a culture yeah. in that conversation. You know, he's, he's standing there talking to God about this woman that God gave him. So really what Adam was doing was he was fostering a culture of victimhood, I'm a culture of passivity, a culture of not my problem, culture of their, you know, a culture of pointing fingers. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so it's, it's really, I believe, um, the responsibility of the husband of the home to lead the home in what is the culture of the home. Oftentimes we think about that and we think a woman, she creates the culture of the home. She creates the feel of the home. And we've really narrow-minded what home, the establishment of home and what culture Mm -hmm. looks like. So what I've seen with you is um, establishing a culture of, hold on a minute. You know, like you you really are good at saying, hold on a minute, everybody, hold on. And, And so it's become normal for us in the culture of our home, if there's a lot of this going on, for dad to say, hold on a second, this isn't who we are. Hold on a moment. Yeah. And um, 
So it's basically a culture of realignment, yeah. culture of in a moment, a quick correction. And so now it can happen inside the car with just me and another kid because that's become normal in our home. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I, that's, the, that's the part that I really want to encourage the men uh, in the room, whether you're a husband right now or you're a hopeful husband. You know, that's a, it's a massive weight for you to carry and represent Jesus. I mean, I represent him too, but in the order of Ephesians, it's really easy to love my husband like I love Jesus because I really love Jesus. And so I can really even overlook things with my husband because I really love Jesus, but he's got to be, he's got to really represent him in our home. You know how hard it is to cherish someone who's imperfect? Yeah. Jesus does that all the time with his church. Yeah. And that's what Chad, that's what you, that's what other husbands, hopeful husbands, that's what you're being asked to, to do is to be the one who represents, who represents Jesus to your kids when they don't deserve your love. And they, they're loving you with a lot of conditions. You can't love them with conditions. Yeah. It's, a, it's a tall order. There was ever a time that a man needed Jesus. It's right now. It's in representing him. That's very good. And the, the, the truth is that it's the song that we sang before, his love won't stop coming after us. Um, I was thinking about the, the prodigal son during the worship and just thinking about how, you know, often when we begin in marriage, it's, it's orphans coming together, trying to figure out how do we walk alongside one another. And an orphan is always grasping, what can I hold on to? That's what the younger son did. It was, I want my share of the estate. I'm going to use it how I want. And um, there was a moment, though, sat in that pig pen when they said, this, I'm not, I've had enough of this. Um, and it's, the Bible says that he came to his senses and he set off home. And I think that's the journey within marriage as well. It's, it's each time you realize, I'm grasping to myself again. I need a set off home. And in that setting off home, what you're doing is realizing his love hasn't stopped coming after me. His love is here right now, even if I've failed in how I'm loving. His love here right now is here to take hold of me mm. and to pick me up and to put me back on track and to wrap me in that robe of righteousness and give me authority back again and bring me back into the, the place of feasting. He's and a healer, Andy. Yeah. 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 